Well, I know the prayer team had some training this morning, uh, and so many of you in the room will answer this question with a resounding no. But I wonder if any of you are ever unsure of what to pray. Maybe somebody shares a kind of difficult situation in their life with you. And they say, I'd really love it if you would pray for me right now. And you go, yeah, of course. And then you close your eyes and you think, what should I actually ask God for? What's the most important thing? And so you start to kind of fumble your way through. You go, Lord, I pray you would heal them. Oh, but God, if that's not your will, then we're, we're okay with it if, you, if, if sickness is your will. Or maybe, God, you could use some doctors to heal them, and we thank you for your common grace. But, Lord, it'd be really cool if you did a miracle. But, God, no pressure. It's okay. Do whatever you want to do. We just trust you. Just, but just do something. I think I feel like that sometimes when I pray, scrambling around for the right thing to pray for. So it's helpful that in John 17 we see the Lord of heaven and earth pray. He wants to help us out. Last week we saw Jesus pray for his disciples. He prayed for the 11. By extension, we saw his heart for us. But now in verse 20, he very explicitly says, Lord, I'm now praying not just for my disciples, but for everyone who will hear and know and believe because of them. He turns his attention to us. What Ruth has just read is Christ's prayer for me and you. Christ's prayer for his church today. And you might have noticed that he's not like us at all. He's not scrambling around looking for something to ask God for. He's not just covering his bases. He just goes in six verses for us. He wasn't praying in verses. In six verses just says, Lord, this is, this is what I need you to do for my people. He has really one request. He knows what to pray. In this moment, as he envisions his church unfolding through the centuries, stretching into the future, he just asks God to make us one. The thing that Christ pleads with his Father for, in a real sense, his dying wish is that his church would be united. That's his desire. That's where he goes when he very briefly lays out to his father what he wants for his people. One thing, unity. That is not the top of my prayer list. It's just not. I come to God and I say, God, help me today with this, this, and this. I might spend some time worshiping him. I might pray for a few people that I know are having a hard time. I don't often come and beg with God for unity. But for Jesus, this is really serious business. It's top of his list. That we would be one, not divided, not at odds with each other, not bickering. That's the desire of Jesus' heart. So all we want to do this morning is just bridge the gap between our hearts that just kind of pray for everything else and Jesus' heart that is so concerned with our oneness. So just two things we'll explore together as we kind of try and inhabit the reality that Christ prays for. First, the church reflects the Trinity. In our unity, we become like God. And then second, the church reveals the Trinity. In our unity, we make God known to the world. That's it. The church reflects and reveals the Trinitarian God. That's the great hope of Jesus as he comes to his Father at the end of John 17. And that is God's great plan for the world. That's his plan. That's, that's what he's given the world. A church that reflects and reveals his glory. So let's see first how the church reflects the glory of the Trinity. <clears throat> Jesus' first request is so simple. He just says, May they all be one as you, Father, are in me and I am in you. And may they also be in us. If we've been paying attention in John's Gospel, the last part of that shouldn't surprise us. We've just seen over and over and over this call to be in Christ and through our union with him to be somehow mysteriously united to God the Father. In fact, we could go as far as saying that this kind of one in one anotherness is the heartbeat of John's Gospel. For the whole time that Jesus has been in the upper room teaching his disciples, he will not stop telling them about the union he has with his Father. I am in him and he is in me. We've just seen over and over that God is a community of eternal love and joy. That's how John opens his gospel. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. 
In John 15, Jesus makes it clear. Remain in me. Remain in the God who remains in himself. The only source of life Jesus needs us to know is in him. It's not that Jesus comes to us as a kind of dispenser of good things. He's not a vending machine where we punch in the numbers and out comes our spiritual blessing of choice. Just like the true gift at an engagement is not the ring. Thanks, man. It's not the ring. It's not, I get down on one knee, will you marry me? And Abby goes, thank you so much, I really like this. <laughs> See you tomorrow. You know, the true gift at an engagement is a fiancé. The true gift is a person. The ring just symbolizes that. And Christian, Christian gospel is the exact same. We receive in the gospel Jesus. That's the first thing we receive. What did you get from God in the gospel? Well, I got eternal life and I got the gift of tongues. And I got a great church family. Jesus just wants to pull us back and say, you know, we, we get him. Jesus is the gospel. Jesus is the gospel, and in him, folded into him, are all the blessings of eternal life. But they only exist inside of him. They're not outside of him in any way. And that's just what we've said repeatedly over and over for the last 15 months. We need union with Christ. We need to remain in the Son. We need to make our home in God through Christ. Or else we have nothing. If we are outside of him, then we are left cold and alone and hopeless. That's the reality of what John has been over and over trying to show us in his gospel. And so that's why when Jesus comes to his father, he asks that we might be in them. It's the only place in the universe that life exists. But we know that. We've, we've seen that. I hope at this point, you're not surprised by that. What is surprising is that for Jesus, all of that is not an individual pursuit. It's not something that I do on my own. It's a plural activity. It's a team sport. To be united to Christ, apparently, is not an individual decision. It's something that happens to us together. As a people, let them be in us, he says. So we have union vertically with the God who is love. But that must mean that we have union this way, horizontally, because God has union in himself. You might think of it this way, if God is in the heavens and he's drawing us towards himself, well, the reality is as we approach him together, we get closer together ourselves to the point where we are all in Christ, occupying the same space. We are one. May they be one just as we are one. That's Jesus' prayer. What does he ask for? He asks that his church would reflect the Trinity. He asks that when we look around this room, we might just see a glimpse of the eternal reality of God. And we reflect the Trinity in two main ways. First, we are united in our diversity. Let's just talk about that word diversity. It's an important word. The Bible presents an image of a people at the end of time united in Jesus that are more diverse than any community in history. In Revelation 5, we see a picture of the elders before the throne of God rejoicing as they sing this song. Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals. For you were slain and by your blood you have ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. Every tribe and language and people and nation stand before the throne of God in eternity. That's the Christian hope. If you're uncomfortable with that, you're uncomfortable with the gospel. God's church is a gloriously multiracial, multilingual, multi-class, multi fill in the blank community of love. That's God's design. He wants us to fill the earth with our unique culture and language and idiosyncrasies. In fact, I think Revelation would show us that that's not just for now, but that's an eternal reality. That 
into eternity, I would remain a white Scottish man. And that's to God's glory. I am who I am. And we are together who we are. And it reflects God's glory as in our diversity we worship him eternally. The eternal people of God will be diverse. I'm going to hedge my bets that that's not something that offends you today. Not many of us. But what we need to see about that diversity, the diversity of God's kingdom, is that it's not diversity just for diversity's sake. Diversity in God's kingdom is a glorious thing because the church is united in her diversity. See, diversity without unity is just another way of describing dictatorship. Eh, Not dictatorship. Division. I got ahead of myself. Sorry. (laughs) (laughs) Diversity without unity is another way of describing division. If we're united around nothing and we're all just different, it's just another way to describe division. Unity without diversity is another way of describing a dictatorship. If this church was just diverse, we'd have nothing to unite around. We would just be divided. We'd be a bunch of individuals. But if the elders stood up here every week and said, if you want to be part of this church, you need to wear a yellow jumper. (laughs) Ian did do that with Matthew. We're working on the unity diversity thing, Ian now. If that was the reality, if we said you must dress this way and speak this way, or else you're not coming through the doors, that's... That's not unity, that's dictatorship. That doesn't reflect anything of God's glory. Jesus doesn't want his people to be divided. He doesn't want them to operate as a dictatorship. He wants them to reflect the divine. Because unity in diversity reflects the very being of God. He himself is one God existing in three persons. Father, Son, and Spirit. We can't separate them. They don't do their own thing. They are one God. And yet at the same time, they differ in their relation to one another. The Father is not the Son. The Spirit is not the Father. We can't confuse them and we must not divide them. And the church should be similar. Yeah, we're distinct. I really am resisting Ian's call for me to wear a mustard jumper. We're different people. In many ways, we're different in this room. If you look around you, you would say, I don't think this looks like the people I would necessarily hang out with. But it's the glory of Jesus' church that we are one. We're united around Jesus, not our styles, not our tastes, not our interests, our hobbies. See, a unity that only exists because we agree A unity that only exists because we both like football or we both like the same music. That's not unity at all. True unity can only exist in diversity. When people from all tribes and nations and classes, people who have very different tastes and interests, very different temperaments, who grate up against each other, when all of those people are united around the person of Jesus, that's unity. That's real unity. And it's real unity because it reflects the unity of the Trinitarian God, three in one. You'd be surprised to know that I agree with C.S. Lewis. Heaven will display far more variety than hell. Do you know why that is? Because hell is so claustrophobic. All that hell can fit is the claustrophobic self-love of sin. Nothing else exists there. Heaven is expansive and glorious enough to fit me and you in all of our differences. God is not so weak that he needs to pin us down to all be the same. Heaven will display far more variety than hell. We're united in our diversity. Here's how all that plays out. Second... We are a community of self-giving love. Jesus ends his prayer with this. He says, so that the love that you have loved me with may be in them. So our unity isn't just, well, we all show up to the same place. And it's funny because I I dress differently to that guy over here. We're really united around Jesus. It means something. It means that our unity is expressed by becoming like God who is love. So Paul is pressing on in Ephesians 4. 
when he says, bear with one another in love, making every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Here's Christ's prayer for us. It's that each one of us in this room would prefer one another to ourselves. And just look at the way the Father and the Son interact. We saw this last week in verse 1 of chapter 17. Jesus prays, Father, glorify your Son so that I may glorify you. I just noticed that the Son doesn't glorify himself. He doesn't glorify himself. He only asks for glory so that he can glorify his Father. We see the same with the Spirit. Chapter 16, verse 14, Jesus describes the Spirit and says, He will glorify me. He will glorify me. They glorify one another. Jesus doesn't come sounding his own trumpet. The Spirit doesn't come to us so that we might talk about the Spirit all the time. There is a kind of self-giving, humble, glorifying the other within God. Just imagine this with me. What would change in our church if each of us just decided right now that I'm going to work hard to honor the other and I'm just going to leave my own glory to God? Like I'm not going to do anything to be seen or heard or known or loved. I'm going to put everything I have into glorifying everyone else in this room. Like I want them to be lifted up. And we just said, Lord, I trust my own life to you. I trust my own life to the church. What would change? What would change if we stopped clawing at our own fame? Here's the reality. If the church reflects the Trinity, then I do not need to fight for my own glory. I can lay down that anxiety. I need to keep living as though there's scarce resources and I better get my own or else I'm in trouble. I say, no, Lord, I want to be like you because I trust this people. I trust that they reflect your glory. I don't need to fight for my own glory. Honestly, that's your job. It's not mine. We're not called to compete. In fact, there is one place in the New Testament we are called to compete with one another. In fact, the New Testament would call us to try very, very hard to beat one another in this area. To the degree where I lie in bed at night thinking, I'm going to beat him at this tomorrow. I want to be the best in this church at this thing. Here's what that thing is. Romans 12, 10, Paul says to the church, outdo one another in showing honor. Outdo one another. Are you competitive? I am. I start to get a bit agitated if I'm losing at something. Let me just invite you into a competition. I hope you might take more seriously than your next race or your next match. Work very hard at being the most over the top, the most extravagant encourager of people in this room. Like, sit at home and strategize. How am I going to get, be- how am I going to beat my PB at encouraging the people of Glasgow Grace this week? Outdo one another. And if you see someone else beating you at honoring everyone else, go, no, not on my watch. That's not happening. I'm winning this one. Outdo one another. Make it the object of your competitive energy to love this church with all that you have. That's, that's what the Bible calls us to. Outdo one another in showing honor. Okay, now let's, let's be honest. That sounds fun, but it's not easy. It's very hard. There's a reason that that's funny, because none of us are doing that. None of us are genuinely approaching God's people and going, I am going to be the best in the world at loving them. This thing is hard. The Bible doesn't hide from that reality. Let me just show you that from a couple of uh, mentions that Paul gives in his letters to situations in the churches. Philippians 4.2, Paul addresses a very real situation as though he were addressing two people in this room. And maybe he is. 
Maybe you need this reminder. Philippians 4.2, Paul says, I plead with Iodia and I plead with Syntyche to be of the same mind in the Lord. So here you have a first century church and they are struggling with the reality of unity. This is a real struggle, two very real people. Ephesians 4.31, and notice the words get rid in this verse. These things already exist. Get rid of all bitterness, rage and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Like, that's not hypothetical. Get rid of these things. Doesn't mean don't start doing these things. It means I know that you are bitter, that you're enraged, that you're angry, that you're brawling and slandering one another. Stop. That's what Paul says. These things are hard. The earliest Christians all the way through the centuries to us in this room struggle with this. We struggle to love one another. We struggle to bear with one another in love. Stuff is very, very hard. And it's hard because it calls us to the kind of love that Christ has for us. A costly love. The kind of love that embraces death and humiliation for the sake of another. That's the kind of love Christ has for his church. That's how he feels about us. That's why he turns his face towards the cross and embraces death for her. Unity is hard, but because of Christ's love, it is worth it. The church is utterly and completely worth it. I want you to do something right now. And I want to ask you not to be awkward or cynical. Just look around. Look in the eyes of a few people. Look behind you and in front of you and around you. Do you know what you're looking at? You are looking at the bride of Christ. You're looking at Jesus' beloved. I remember the moment when I'm equivalently standing here and Abby turns the corner and you just go, <laughs> what do you have? It's stunning. And we look around here and we go, oh yeah, that's that guy I'm having a fight with right now. There is a moment coming in history where Jesus stands here and you and I walk towards him and he is speechless in love. Utterly speechless. It's my bride. It's my beloved. Here she comes. She's mine. She's stunning. So Jesus feels about his church. The church is the affection of his heart. She's the one that he will do anything for. The one that he died for. The one that right now he sits in heaven going, the wedding day's coming. The one that one day will come out of heaven adorned like a bride. Pure and white and glorious. That's the church. That's the church. When you looked around, that's what you saw. Now, here's the rub, because when we refuse to be united, when we bicker with one another, it's as though we are in the room on the morning of the wedding and the bride is getting changed and we are just sneaking up behind her and ripping holes in her wedding dress, smearing mud on her, just not preparing her, not getting her ready, but just tarnishing her. She's the bride of Christ and we so often drag her through the mud of our own self-glory. Just hear what we're saying. Because we use the church. Don't we? We use the church. We say, well, there's so-and-so at church is re-helping me with this thing. That's great. 
Or if I wasn't at church, I don't think I would have as many friends. Again, I'm so glad. But she is the bride of Christ. The one that he is just utterly transfixed by. And we use her for our own needs. Do you know, I was begging God this week. Just begging him that he would let me love you like he loved you. Just suddenly confronted with the reality that what I'm looking at right now is the hope of the world, is the heartbeat of God, is the thing that he doesn't stop thinking about. And, and, and here's, what, here's what I do. I say, oh, I'm, I'm preaching this morning. I better get my notes in order. I'm just begging God this week, Lord, I don't want to do this. I don't want to do this unless I love you. And I don't want you to do this unless you love the church. There's no point in us being here. This is the most beautiful place on earth. Most of us don't believe that. When you looked around, you saw the most beautiful thing on earth. I'm just pleading with God, don't let us do this unless we get it. Don't, don't let us miss the beauty of your bride. Here's Jesus just begging his father to protect and preserve his beloved. How dare we disregard her? How dare we just be casual about her? How dare we feel complacent about one another? Get to the point of hating one another. The church is worth the cost. She is worth the price. But pursuing unity is also worth it, Jesus will say, because the world needs our unity. That's what we'll see next. The church reveals the Trinity. Look at verse 23 again. Jesus prays what he prays and then he explains why he prays it. He says, so that they may be completely one, that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. Now here's the shocking claim that Jesus makes. The degree to which you and I are united in love is the degree to which the world will see and know and believe that Jesus is Lord. That's what Jesus says. That feels uncomfortable. That's the equivalence he makes. So he meant in John 13, by this everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Loving unity is the ground floor of God's mission in the world. That means that Jesus makes the presumption that our unity must be visible. It's not just an idea. It's something that has arms and legs. It's something that the world can observe. It means something and it does something. And so in our unity, we, yes, reflect the Trinity upwards, but we also must reveal the Trinity outwards. It's God's design that as those who don't know Jesus yet come into contact with his church, they would just be stunned by what they see. Look how they love one another. How did this lot end up together? And then how did they end up together with such love? So how do we pursue unity in such a way that a watching world becomes captivated by what they see? To be practical, I just want to recommend four things to you. The first one is going to sound counterintuitive, bear with me. Prioritize the people of God. Okay, now what I'm about to say might be controversial. I just want you to hear Paul's words in Galatians 6. I want you to know I'm not making this up. And then let me explain. Galatians 6.10 says, therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. That word especially is controversial. I just want to, I think it's far from unloving. I think it makes perfect sense. Let me explain. Think about the mission of God himself. So the sending of Jesus into the world comes from the bubbling over of the eternal, joyful union of God. Love begins in God. 
It doesn't begin when he sends his son to rescue the world. It begins in eternity past between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So if we are called to be one just like God is one, then our mission needs to find its power, needs to find its source in our love for one another. So leaving the church behind just to get on the streets and preach as much as we can and pass out cups of tea as much as we can might feel like love. But the biblical pattern is that we love one another. We say, this is my home. This is my family. I love this people. And then our love for one another just begins to bubble out, spill over into the world. So counterintuitively, what's the first thing we need to do to really see our unity be leveraged for mission is prioritize one another. The church isn't somewhere we just retreat after a long week of doing stuff. The church is not just somewhere we go to and we need to recover. It's the place and the people that we live from. Without prioritizing love for one another, we will run dry. We'll just, we'll just have no reserves to love anyone else with. Practically, which means we don't neglect meeting together. We make time together. It's formal, informal, whatever. It's just a high priority in our schedules. That we don't get so busy doing stuff that we don't just be with one another. Don't just love one another well. Pray for each other. It means we turn to each other for wisdom and care before we turn to the world. Power will flow from there. Prioritize the people of God. Secondly, speak well of Christ's bride. If the church is the bride of Christ and you and I are united together as one into the eternal family of God, Here's something very practical that means. You cannot speak about the people in this room as though they're just members of a sports club you go to. Just be honest with each other. It's kind of low-level gossip. So easy. So-and-so said this. I'm getting very frustrated right now because... Whatever. What do you think it does to your public witness to the glory of God if you spend all of your time tearing apart his bride... How does that convince anyone? How can we show the world the gospel when we just spend so much time working hard to differentiate ourselves from other Christians? Well, yeah, I'm a Christian, but I'm, just, just to be clear, I'm not like those Christians. Like, most other Christians are kind of weird. Don't worry about that. I'm not like that. That does not help you. Do you want to know all that does? All it does is draw people to you. The world does not need anyone drawn to you. The hope of the world is not that you would have followers. The hope of the world is that Jesus, in his glory, would be seen and adored and trusted. Stop tearing his bride to shreds. Who on earth would join a community that you whine about so much? Who would do that? You really should come to church. Oh, by the way, word vomit everything that everyone's done wrong in the church to you. I don't want to be part of that community. Nobody does. You must, we must be set apart just by our stubborn refusal to take part in the gossip of the world. We need to resolve. I, I am utterly unwilling, utterly unwilling at any moment to speak purely of Christ's beloved. I'm just not doing it. It needs to be our shared commitment. Speak well of Christ's bride. Number three, go out on mission together. There is a good reason that when you read through Acts, Paul is always accompanied by someone. He just knows what we forget. Only a far more effectiveness and power when we're together. Just remember this. We're not called to the task of mission as a bunch of individual missionaries, but as a body. That means that the gifts of the Holy Spirit are designed to be tag-teamed. They're designed to work together. They lose their glory and their effectiveness when we go, I'm just doing this. We need to work together. We need to recognize perhaps you don't have a strong gift of evangelism. That's okay. The church exists. Just grab someone who does. 
Would you come over and meet my friends? They're asking all these questions. I don't know what to say. Maybe you just feel like you sometimes lack power when you pray. That's okay. The church exists. Hey, would you pray for so-and-so? I just feel there's something on you when you pray God answers. Would you pray for the next few weeks for my friend? We need to do it together. We need to do it together. Once again, if it's just about me, we fall flat. Because the moment that I make a mistake, the moment that I show someone that I'm not Jesus, the whole thing just crumbles. But if you are drawing them to Jesus through his church, there's security there. Do mission together helps us to have much more effectiveness. Number four, just as we land. We'll come back to this in a moment. We have missional power in our unity when we come to the table properly. Here's why we say every week that this meal is a gift for Christians alone. We say that because unity means something. Unity isn't all-inclusivism. We are united together in love around the table because of the person of Jesus. We must know him to come to the table. And so if, if you're not a Christian in this room, my hope, our hope, is that the process of observing, of not coming, just makes you realize that you're missing out on something. Like, I want you to feel a little bit awkward in that moment. I want you to feel there's something I don't have access to, because that's true. This church is united around the person of Jesus, not just around anything we fancy. So to come to this table, because it represents so vividly our unity, because it represents that Christ's people are being saved forever, and if you're outside of him, there is only death, because it represents that, to come to the table is so serious. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 10 that when we eat, we participate in Christ together. And so we must come properly. We must come willing to forgive. When we take communion, we express our shared communion with one another and with God. That's how serious this is. Just, even as we come to finish right now, I just wonder if you might reflect. Am I coming properly? Am I united to this people? Am I harboring something that I need to forgive. When we come in a moment, we're going to have a chance just to come properly, to be reconciled to one another. That's in a moment, but for now, I hope you see that our unity is just directly correlated to our missional power. Church Father John Chrysostom said, they will know the teacher by the disciples. They will know the teacher by the disciples. If that doesn't put a little bit of holy fear in us, I don't think we understand what Jesus is saying. We're just called to something. This is not casual. This is not casual. Our unity isn't just like, oh, well, wouldn't that be nice? Wouldn't it be cool to be part of a church like that? No, for the sake of the world, this is non-negotiable. How will the world believe in the God of peace? if his body are fighting with one another? How will they believe that God is love if we despise one another? You know, the logo of God's grace is a, a tree covering the city. That's because we want our roots to go into the gospel and then as the church grows, we want to shelter the city with gospel shade. Chop down that tree into a bunch of branches lying on the floor and separated and nobody is sheltering in them. All you have is twigs. I don't want to be part of that. I have no desire to give my life to a pile of twigs. I think you're with me when I say I'm willing to give my life to the pursuit of something that shelters a city that brings life and joy to people who once walked in darkness. That's what I want. If we want to see our friends and family recognize and receive Christ, how can we do that? What program should we put on? 
Maybe we could run another alpha course. Who might? Better preaching. Probably. We need to trust Jesus on this because his answer is none of those things. Here's what he says. The best program we have to make disciples and see Glasgow changed, love one another. Love one another. 